Welcome everybody to the Common Council Executive Committee. Um, already I'm like, do we uh, call the roll first or then, or do we go to tax facilitator first? Call the roll. Let's do that. Okay, President Abbas is excused. Vice President Martin. I'm here. Alder Lemmer. Here. Alder Bennett. Alder Wahalia. Here. Alder Heck. Here. Alder Harrington McKinney. Alder Carter. Present. We have quorum. Oh, and this time just I don't always see folks when they come in. So if someone can um, give a, a shout out, if any of the other committee members do come in and I will make sure to get them marked down. Thank you so much. All right, um, thank you. So now we go to our tech facilitator. All right, welcome to our virtual meeting. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. Members of the committee, if you're able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you're able, please activate your video when you're speaking. In this meeting, panelists have the ability to mute and unmute themselves. Panelists also have the ability to add pronouns after their names if they choose. Please do not alter the current naming convention. Uh, simply add text after your name. Please use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak ask questions or request a roll call vote. Uh, staff, please use the raise hand feature when you're asked a question. The chair will do their best to call on committee members in the order in which hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will re remain muted until called upon. Staff will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the committee, please send it to the email listed on today's agenda. Vice President Martin, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I see uh, Alder Bennett has raised her hand. Oh, she's in the attendees list. Can, can you promote me, please? Yep. Okay. Looks like we've got that all set. Okay, so um, our first order of business is approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Um, do I have a motion? Approve the minute. All right. First, uh, all right, thank you. Uh, moved by Alder Wahelier and seconded by Alder Lemmer. Um, now, unless I have any objections, um, I would like to record a unanimous uh, uh, or a unanimous approval. Any hands? Nope. Okay, that motion passes. Now we are on our first item: public comment, and it appears we do have um, registrants. At least one. I'm reloading. Okay. Um, our first um, uh, commenter is Bonnie Rowe of Somerset Lane. Oh, hold on. Alder Bonnie Martin. Before. Yes. Can you do disclosures and recusals yeah. before we go to that? Sure. Hold on, Thank Bonnie. You. Thank you so much, Alder Carter. So, yes, if anybody has any uh, disclosures or recusals um, that people would like to uh, say, anybody have any? Nope. Okay, in that case, now we are back to a public comment. Um, and hold on, going back here. And uh, Bonnie Rowe, let's see. I have clicked ask to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, I'm speaking on agenda item three soon and wanted to register my thoughts as this is a very important issue to me. I attended every one of the police body worn camera review committees meetings for many months and watched as the final report and model policy were drafted. And I can vouch for the quality of their work. A recent study shows the vast majority of Americans, about 90% nationwide, depending on the study, want their police officers equipped with body worn cameras. Black Americans consistently favor their use at a much higher percentage than whites. Cities all over have equipped their officers with body cameras, starting after the killing of Michael Brown Jr. by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, and all the others leading up to George Floyd and beyond. 
Body cameras were instrumental in Derek Chauvin's conviction, the officer involved shooting of Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, and in recent cases all across the country. Kenosha's district attorney lamented they hadn't acted after receiving city council approval for body cameras and said their footage would have been vital in the investigation of the officer involved shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha. Imagine if Officer Kenny had been wearing a body worn camera when Tony Robinson was shot seven times and killed. We wouldn't have to wonder what happened in that stairwell and try to piece it together with no video footage. While body cameras are not a cure-all for policing problems, Federal Police Monitor Peter Zimroth said in a report, their ability to illuminate police encounters can be a powerful tool for increasing transparency and accountability for officers, the public, and for police oversight officials. Some 22,000 of the roughly 35,000 officers in the NYPD wear body cameras, including all officers on patrol and in specialized units. Zimroth says the NPD has long since deployed body-worn cameras for its entire patrol force to realize the benefits of increased transparency and better compliance by officers with the policies and procedures, including those related to street stops. Body cameras were instrumental in proving that people of color were being unfairly targeted in stop and frisk operations. Body cameras are routinely used by the police, prosecutors, and the city's civilian police watchdog agencies to investigate crimes and review officer conduct in the line of duty. The Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York City, which investigates filed by civilians, has said that body camera footage is the likelihood that its invest will be able to complete their investigations and substantiate claims against officers. In cases without video footage, evidence is often limited to the suspect said versus the officer said, which almost always tends to favor officers. Body cameras are an important tool for discovery, eyewitness interviews, interviews with suspects, domestic violence calls, um, all of these things, they are a tool for discovery. All right, thank you, Bonnie, for your comments. Um, I have, um, it looks like Alder Bennett has uh, put her name in for, for item one, but I presume that you're okay. I, I couldn't find the links. So. Okay, <laughs> no, no problem, just making sure. I thank you so much. And we'll hit one more refresh here just to make sure we're all set. And yes, so that will move us to agenda item um, two, uh, number 65876, the Energy Innovation Grant, Energy Upgrades to Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing. Um, and this looks like is it's a presentation. So. Uh, yeah, thank you. And um, not a visual presentation, just a, um, an overview of a grant that we have received and that will launch a program that we are starting. We're starting it um, in you know, one form and we're hoping to grow it over time. And this is related to providing energy and, and, and other upgrades in what we call naturally occurring affordable housing. This is a a term, actually, this is a program, I should say, that started um, between two organizations, um, Elevate uh, and Ele formerly Elevate Energy and Sustain Dane. And they were recognizing the need for the city to um, improve energy efficiency in, in housing stock. Um, this, this is part of our climate agenda. So um, part of our climate forward agenda is to do this work, recognizing that about half the emissions in the city come from buildings, um, about 40% more come from transportation. And um, so thinking about all of our existing buildings and how to make progress, how to make them more energy efficient, how to um, reduce their emissions, that of course has to be on our agenda if, if we're serious about meeting our climate goals. And of course, um, Thinking about how that relates to multifamily housing and more affordable housing is also very important because, of course, climate action is not about counting metric tons of carbon dioxide. It's about making your communities better places. And this is an area where I think there's opportunity for multiple benefits. Um, so let me start by saying what I mean by this NOAA or naturally occurring affordable housing. So 
This is housing that is not publicly subsidized housing and yet tends to be affordable. So it, it, it tends to rent at affordable rates, um, similar to um, what you would find in, in subsidized housing. Um, and um, it's been targeted to neighborhoods where the um, at least half the residents are at or below 80% of area median income. And um, this tends to be older housing. It tends to be less energy efficient. So the energy bills tend to be higher. In some cases, the units may be less comfortable. They just have more and more opportunity to upgrade. It's often costly to do upgrades in multifamily housing. And if it's not broke, it may not get fixed at the rate that um, owner occupied housing gets fixed. So, um, and in fact, we, we see this play out in the data. We see that um, um, affordable housing units uh, use 33% more energy than market rate units. So um, this is a grant, it's a program that actually started, like I said, with Sustain Day and Elevate, where they were um, looking at an efficiency navigator, where they were working with um, um, owners and, and tenants of this um, naturally occurring affordable housing, as they call it, to um, conduct energy assessments, water assessments, work with folks and find funding sources, find rebates, package that all together and learn about what was real, like do they really have viable um, retrofit packages that pay back quickly and, and provide benefits quickly and, and how do, to, do they work with folks to take the next step. Um, the city was able to join that work by applying for and receiving a state grant from the Office of Energy Innovation to actually then take the step to retrofit those, those buildings. So we're very happy to do that. We're, it's, a, it's a small grant, so it's, it's obviously not going to take care of, of all of the buildings in town, but I think it's a, an area where we can grow our work over time. So we're starting with actually four buildings that have already gone through and received these energy upgrades. Um, we will be moving forward and conducting retrofits there. Um, and these were, I think, largely in, in the Meadowood area. And we're also looking to um, expand where, where the work is happening and seek new buildings to, to conduct this work. And we, we um, um, are focused on the north side and in the grant we, we partnered with the north side planning council for some outreach work there to help identify potential buildings that are candidates for this work. These are small multifamily. A lot of these that they've worked with so far are like four plexes, eight plexes. Some are a little larger, but, but it's that small medium scale. And um, yeah, we're hopeful that with this grant, we can do 100 units and get 10 to 20 percent energy savings in each. And, and in the process, we're reducing the energy bills, creating more comfortable homes. Um, and I'd say we're also interested in expanding the work further. And some of we've already been a little bit successful there, and we have a lot more underway that I just want to share. So we, we know that buildings, any building, it has probably a list of things it could benefit from. And sure, some of that might relate to energy efficiency and, and some of that might relate to water efficiency and some of that might relate to other issues completely. And um, we particularly have heard stories about mold and basement mold that people are struggling to remediate after the 2018 floods and the link to health impacts. Um, and we, there, we just received a $10,000 grant from the um, Healthy Babies Bright Future Fund in, in coordination with the Mayor's Innovation Project to do the work to see what it would take to at, make it make this also a healthy home project. So $10,000 obviously isn't going to go out and do mold mitigation or lead mitigation in homes, but it might help us learn what we need to learn to fold those aspects in and design that program and do that research. Um, and they're all, and because we received that grant, we're also going to, when we do these energy assessments, um, conduct mold assessments and, and lead assessments as well. So where do we find lead in homes? Where do we find lead in homes? And what would it take to remediate those as well? Um, we've also sought another grant that we haven't heard back yet from of whether we could also add solar to rooftops. Um, we are also keenly aware that the Biden administration um, has an interest here as well. Uh, when the Biden administration thinks about what cities need for infrastructure in the future, um, particularly in cl changing climates, and in Wisconsin, that means warmer and wetter. 
um, what do they need? And they're thinking broadly, infrastructure is not just streets and bridges, it's to housing stock as well. And, and what, do, what does your city need to be ready? And how can we look at places where climate action also truly immediately improves people's day-to-day -day lives and creates jobs and, 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 and has multiple benefits. So we think programs like this one may, um, you know, if, if, if their programs continue to roll out with more grant funding, we believe these are the types of programs we may be able to expand in the future and, and look more and more at how we can create those multiple benefits and, and, and um, to focus more on workforce um, development as well. So, um, Alder Abbas had just asked, President Abbas had just asked that I share an up update on this program with you all. Um, some because it's related to your district, some because you have an interest in climate, some because you have an interest in housing. And so I just wanted to share this as, as one piece of the work that we're starting to develop and that we, we certainly still have a lot of learning to do about how it goes and certainly a lot of room to grow in the future. But I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor um, Alder Carter. Um, there you go. Go for it. Thank you, Vice President Martin. Um, yeah, I have a couple questions. The Energy Innovation Grant, how much was that? That is $250,000. And I, I will comment, I meant to say this will be coming to you for acceptance in a resolution. We're working out some of the grants. Sure. With the and when when you talk about the older housing stock, are we talking approximately like fifty years old? Um, when you look at Meadowood, we're in that age range on those apartments over there. So is is that the age you're looking at as far as older apartments? And the, the examples that we have so far in Meadow was the one, I have not seen all of the buildings, but the handful that I have seen were it roughly in that age group. So I don't, we aren't, we aren't putting date ranges on the program, but, um, but yeah, I think that will be a typical type of, um, yeah. of building. Well, that age group makes sense to me. Um, and then, and though that age group also offers the more affordable rents because of the older buildings. Um, one of the other things that you mentioned was the healthy baby grant. Can you um, give me a little bit more information on that? Are you using that um, those parameters to work with the energy innovation grant, or is that a separate focus? It will be, we're trying, we're, so it's a $10,000 grant, so it's very small. So it's really a planning grant, but yes, we would add, oh, okay. we're adding to that same program. And what we're trying to investigate is um, what does it take to add these other parameters? What do we need to know? Are we finding that we have, for example, just questions we would want to investigate. Um, are we finding that we have the energy need and and water needs and mold needs in the same houses or same buildings or are they different buildings? Do we see the overlap? What mm -hmm. be in terms of different contractor needs um, and skill sets? Um, what are the what are the costs? How would we design a program to put all of these pieces in place? What would we need in future funding to support? fully developing and implementing that and where would those funding streams come from. Um, so part of this is data crunching and data analysis and part of it is outreach and engagement and learning and then part would be program design. So if implementation would come after this grant based on, on the outcomes of, of this planning process. Any more questions, Alder Carter? Oh, is she frozen? Okay, um, next we'll go um, to Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christy, for all that good information. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I'm wondering about the, the uh, I'll call it the burden placed upon uh, property owners, homeowners, as they seek this, will they have to apply with uh, 
a, a third party or how do they, how does the process work and they don't have to pay for contractors themselves and get reimbursed? How, how do you envision that? So I apologize. I feel like my dog barks every time I'm giving a presentation. So, um, <laughs> um, so let's see. So I think we're still working out some of those final details and, and part of that will be working with, with the owners and the contractors and figuring out what works. But our intention is to not have them have that out of pocket expense that we reimburse, that we would be able to handle it. So that's our goal. Um, and you know, we recognize that that's one of the barriers, right? Is not having that cash. So um, we're we're trying not to put up that artificial barrier when we recognize that's the reason this work isn't happening to begin with. So I think we'll be able to do that, but just in terms of what that um, stream of payment looks like in fine detail, we're we're, we're kind of still still um, still kind of. Thanks. And, and, and do, you, do you anticipate that the city will run this kind of oh, this program or will there be a third party involved or? Yeah, we applied, we applied in, um, uh, in partnership with Sustaining and Elevate Energy because we are basically um, taking the program to the next step and they're they're currently running and administering the program so this would include a, a contract with them to continue administering the program i see thank you very much okay uh next alder harrington mckinney uh thank you madam vice chair and uh i do apologize that i had to join late and you might have already covered this but just briefly um in this initial selection process doing the pilot or you know just getting it started um, what was the, the uh, that criteria and then my second question is kind of looped upon the the next one um, is there some kind of uh, matrix that that will be developed where um, they have to fit you know these check boxes or how would that process look and and how accessible would that be Sure. Um, I'm afraid I will have to get back to you with a question on the exact selection process for the first eight that they took through energy audits. Um, I that was they actually went through that process before this grant, so before the city was a partner. So I can um, look into that and get you more information. Um, and I'm sorry, can you repeat the second half of your question. Uh, well, really, the second half is really tied upon the first. Is is that um, um, when when there is funding and there's an opportunity to expand the program, is there will be a, a matrix where uh, uh, people can know whether they fit, whether they're eligible, what would that criteria be, or is it just too early to determine? I think that that's actually a, a, a very good idea. Um, I think our 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 this is you know, a, a frankly, and you know, getting involved in somebody's building is not something that, um, you know, people are always chomping at the bit for. So um, we've been pretty early in our outreach and have not yet fully learned whether we're going to have a lot of interest or a little interest and whether we will um, um, have to, um, um, you know, have a competitive offering or if anybody who's interested will be able to be served. So I think we have a little bit to learn there, but certainly if we start getting calls and interest and people would like to know more, does, is, does my building qualify? I think that's absolutely a type of resource we would have available. So I imagine that that will exist as part of our outreach materials and and it will be able Sure. Okay, and so the, my final question is, is that um, the reason that I brought that up is, is that uh, there's always going to be an ask of uh, why, why them and not me. And so if there is a, um, a process by which uh, you can say this is the process that we use, it just saves a lot of confusion mm -hmm. down the road. So um, uh, please keep an eye on that. And so we want to make it accessible, but um, we'll, uh, we really do want to make it fair and equitable as well. And we can uh, on the front end. 
Yes, complete, completely agree. And and so happy to share more information on that as we as we get a little further into how those pieces will all be designed. Uh, are you are you uh, done with your questions then, Alder McKinney? Okay, excellent. Um, next is Alder Wahelier. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Kristen, for, for your presentation. My question is, as you alluded, the grant for 250K, and you talked about the 100 uh, units. Is that the only uh, multifamily units or apartment that it can cover, or it can be more than that? We, um, are you asking me, can it be more than that number of units, or can it be, can it be more than multifamily? Like different types of yes, both, both. Both. Okay. We are limiting it to multifamily rental housing. Um, mm. and the number of units is really just an estimate based on um, our best guess. Uh, based on the energy audits they've done in other buildings so far and what they find buildings need, projecting that forward to say if we continue to see the same type of need at you know roughly this estimated standard industry cost we probably have enough money to do about 100 units. So it's a bit of an estimate. Um, we're certainly not limited to that, but it's really more than what we think we can do with, with a $250,000 grant. Um, yeah, that's and my other question is for new developers, if they want to build such you know, affordable housing, will they qualify to build such uh, units? Um, this is really focused on older housing, so um, it's not, not at the moment focused on, on um, new construction. What and, if, if they were, let's say, uh, changing from, let's say, uh, commercial to new apartments? You know, like, like a remodel. That's a good question. We have not really thought about that. My instinct is, my instinct is probably not with this part of funding that this would be really focused on, on those buildings that are that are all already being lived in right now and that that would that could use some work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um Alder Carter. Thank you. I got kicked out so I didn't hear my answer, your answer to the Department of Health question. And then the other thing is, so basically owners of the property are eligible or would contact you or you would contact them vice versa for this um, grant, correct? That's, it wouldn't be correct. the tenants. We could do, I believe there has been some outreach and engagement with tenants um, in, in the work that's happened so far, but really mm -hmm. it's the owner that has to um, be willing to say, yes, let's move forward with this. And yeah, okay. Um, the public health question, I'm sorry, Alder Carter, can you repeat? Well, that? I was just wondering, um, there's a variety of uh, lead initiatives in the department. Oops, hold on, I'm, I'm being attacked. Um, hold, oh. um, Arvina, go on. I'm going okay. down. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any uh, questions for the deputy mayor? No. Okay. Um, then we'll probably have to have um, Alder Carter. Uh, ask her questions to you um, uh, offline. So, um, sure. unless she comes back in the next second, no. Okay. Um, so that will take. We don't have to uh, take any action on this item. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It's a really exciting news um, for for housing um, here in Madison, especially affordable housing. Um, that brings us to um, agenda item 363932, which is accepting the final report and model policy from the Body Worn Camera Feasibility Review Committee. Um, and we do have quite a few people registered for this item. 
Um, just one second. Our first is um, Mia Maysack. Um, Mia, yeah, you should have a prompt to unmute yourself. Should be on your screen somewhere. It might be under something. Mia, with being on a phone, you might need to press star six to unmute. No. Um, there we go. Oh, there we go. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. You're on. Uh, grateful for Thank you. I'm so grateful for this time. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious if you all know what day it is today. Um, it is June 15th. And two years ago, Tyrese West was fatally shot and killed by a cop while he was riding a bike. And even with body cam footage, there's been little traction for justice. So let's please just take a moment of silence um, and say his name, Tyrese West. Tyrese West, Tyrese West. On that note, uh, Tony Terrell Robinson Jr. still awaits the dignified thing being done, which is conviction of Officer Matthew Kenny. Whether or not the power is within your job description, this is a demand from the people, not a question. Not much can be said about body cams that I haven't already heard brilliant minds speak on this line in the past. So of course, it's always a little insulting, although sometimes necessary to have the same conversation profusely. So I'm gonna kick it to you like this. I am in opposition of agenda item number three. Police are trained to internalize everything as a threat. They're already equipped with a militarization level of force, along with something like the highest amount of revenue. We say no to yet another opportunity for these agencies to have and hold oppression over our heads. Hypothetically, if we were to follow through on body cameras, they are meant to enforce accountability regarding the conduct of police officers, not to be a tool to use against members of the public. So my questions are, how would that be enforced? And how do we as the people confidently leave our fate in possession of those who have been proven untrustworthy in matters of righteousness? Or in other words, there must be procedures implemented to ensure that tampering with recorded evidence isn't an option for law enforcement. Now, I am not a body cam salesperson to provide a quote, but I do know this approach cannot be cheap. And aren't we all aware by this point that there are a variety of extensive needs throughout our neighborhoods, which does not include a desire for more policing or for more tools to subsequently excuse their lack of law obedience? All the while they continue to punish or even kill us whenever they deem it appropriate. Mr. Smith and Mr. James were both killed in Racine County Jail over Memorial Day weekend. No footage has been released, no questions answered. And part of the problem is I mentioned that here and some are likely wondering why that's relevant to this conversation. Despite grievances captured on camera, not much of anything gets done about it. The narrative is being controlled and thereby weaponized and this is not only abusive, but a complete infringement against basic civil rights. So again, if we were to move forward with body cameras, the feeds need to be live and we need to move into it slowly with the pilot program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mia. Um, next, we have Greg Golembiak of Jennifer Street. Hello. I served in the body cam committee until I resigned when I was precluded from submitting edits to correct remaining errors and omissions in the report. And though everyone on the committee was, I believe, well intended, there was there were serious problems with how the committee functioned. Matthew Brongan, another former member of the committee, posted a Madison 365 piece talking about his experience with the committee. He had to resign early in the process for health reasons. Matthew said, quote, my perception pretty early on was the general group would have a hard time confronting their biases 
for body cams. It seemed there were a lot of ways people were twisting and turning to end at the predetermined con conclusion that Madison should adopt body cams. It really felt like there were core folks in the committee lining up a process that was going to be the recommendation without fully reviewing the data. Those are Matthew's words. One of the core tasks on the committee was reviewing the scientific research on body cams. I was the only scientist on the committee. It seems that everyone loves a scientist until they convey the science, and it's something people don't want to hear. Too often, the response is then to attack the scientist and dismiss their input, as ultimately happened to me. When I tried to correct scientific errors and omissions in the report, I was called overly anal and, quote, relentless in submitting corrections. Six years ago, I started the first petition in Madison asking for body caps. But carefully tracking the signs changed my mind, just as it changed the position of the prominent Black Lives Matter organization, Campaign Zero. As far as I can see, this committee really appeared to lack the depth of scientific curiosity that allows valid scientific understanding to develop. The body cam committee report presents itself as a balanced review, but that's not really the case. It presents unf unfavorable information about body cams, but in important ways understates the cons, misinterprets and omits key science, often engages in wishful thinking about mitigating the problems, and understates the financial cost. I provided you multiple examples of this in letters. One major concern is that body cams can increase surveillance and prosecution of low-level offenses, expanding overcriminalization of heavily policed BIPOC communities. I will add that since the body cam committee chair continued to deny errors that I pointed out in the report's interpretation of the key study in this topic, I provided all of you correspondence between the first and second authors of the study and myself, along with independent reviews by statistician mathematician Professor Brooke Oros and data scientist Avnish Chandra. These all independently corroborate the misrepresentations I've pointed out. The committee report incorrectly claims that the study found that the availability of body cam video did not increase prosecution rates when prosecutors reviewed the video before issuing charges. The study's actual finding was the opposite. Even when video was viewed, prosecution rates of misdemeanors increased 100%. I'll add that in the footnote to the report, the committee chair edited correspondence from the first author of the study deleting two key sentences, pointing to a problem in the committee report text creating a misleading impression. Another example of an egregious deficiency is that the report fails to include any information about some of the most serious cons, including dispositional biases or cognitive liberalism, where people see what they want to see in body cam video. It includes minimal information about other cons, such as how body cams have been used to stage events, with the footage then passed off as real. Because of the perceptual biases the body cam footage generates and the I'm potential I'm to manipulate body cams in many ways, they have the potential to unbalance further erode. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Eric Bach of Tempe Drive. Erica, you should have a problem. There you go. Thank you, Alders and Executive Council members. Um, it's going to be really hard to follow all of that really data-driven information from Dr. Kalembic. So I'm going to just share with you um, just a sort of a reminder that this is not only upon us for this year, but for the many, many, many years that community members have been showing up really since 2013 and 14, and then in great masses since 2015 and 16, um, to say that we, we want to have accountability for our, not only our elected officials that you all do so well, but also for our paid city employees. And so um, a couple of things that I think is really important to just keep in mind is that we've seen widespread all across the country and as of the uprising last year across the world that body cameras do not change use of force. Um, and police officers themselves have told us that. Um, we know by Derek Chauvin and his team's murdering of George Floyd. We know by Matt Kinney's dash cam and Tony Robinson. We know that the cameras themselves are not going to change anyone's behavior. Um, there are some places, including in Madison, where we don't have any limitations to what happens to that footage. Um, there is this isn't this data is not public. Um, it, we would be potentially tied up in litigation for years to try to get some of what might appear on these cameras. And um, and, and that would then put a really big onus on all of you to also have to like police the police and to, to make the rules about what can the footage be used. Is there anything on our books that says MPD can't delete this? 
you know, we don't we don't have that part in place. We've spent so many years just even trying to fight to hold our Madison Police Department accountable that I would imagine we'd be tied up. And again, that will fall to all of you as elected officials to take on that charge. So just going over um, Dr. Chief Barnes blog for the last week um, up through the 14th. So up through yesterday, if you go through and you look at the calls for service, if we were to make a rule saying, we're paying all this money for body cams. We're going to take all the recommendations, even though we know that they might be faulty. We're going to use all of this money. And then you go through and you look at the calls for service. Police officers would be turning off their cameras while they take someone into the hospital. That's a HIPAA violation. While they film a juvenile, that's a that's a FERPA regulation. I mean, county, um, excuse me, city council is going to be tied up. Uh, we're going to have attorneys in litigation for years because we don't have the basis. We're going to be having police officers turn off the cameras that we, the people, are paying so much money for. Um, please go and take a look at Dr. Barnes' blog and just see how many of these would be wildly inappropriate. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Tyson Vitali of Stoughton Road. Let me find you. There you go. Hi, I'm so sorry. My phone is at 1%. I'm looking for my charger. Could you come back to me after the next person? <laughs> yeah, that, that's Okay, nice. sorry. Yep. Okay, so uh, our next our next person, is, our speaker is Hisela Wilson. Oops, I think we got it. Hi, Hi can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Can you hear us? I'm not hearing that you can hear me. Yeah, we we can hear you. Um, Hello? Uh, let's uh, put her down on a little mute again and have tech facilitator work. Or Yeah, out. we'll see if we can reach out to her. Okay, and it, we'll come back. So we'll uh, hopefully... Our next speaker will be able to speak. Um, we have Amy Owen of Buena Vista Street. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a number of concerns about both the report process that I observed over attending several meetings and about the use of body cameras by officers in our city. And I also just wanna know exactly what are our goals for this proposal? Genuinely, just what are our goals? Because I feel like we might be making some assumptions here that are worth articulating and questioning. So do we think that body cameras on law enforcement will improve community safety? Because cameras don't create safety. Investing in vulnerable communities and investing in crime prevention, housing, job training, mental health and addictions treatment. These are all directions that are far more likely to accomplish the goal of improving community safety. Do we think body cameras will improve officer behavior? I think we can all agree that if they need to be recorded in order to do their job appropriately, this is not the job for them. And, and I think none of us wanna call someone for help that has to be video monitored. Do we think body cameras on law enforcement will improve justice system outcomes? So cameras will not necessarily reduce arrests. And as much as we'd all like to believe it, Video footage is just not an unbiased recording of events. It is just not. We'd all love to know what happened in incidences where we just don't know, but video cameras can't necessarily do that for us. And we've all seen over and over that there's no consequence for situations where officers did not have their body cameras turned on when they were supposed to have them on. We've seen partial footage only released. We've seen over and over that harm was done and everyone sees it. And there is no consequence for those who cause the harm. So we just need to remember that documentation is not justice. Body cameras will not improve justice system outcomes. It would be better to invest in public defenders and end cash bail and decriminalize low level offenses, maybe strengthen anti-corruption regulations if we want to improve justice system outcomes. We've got better options for these goals. Documentation is not safety. Documentation is not justice. And body cameras are expensive. Our money is absolutely better spent elsewhere if our actual goal is community, improving community safety or improving justice outcomes. 
And if we want to improve safety and justice, please let's just invest in the programs and services that have a strong track record of accomplishing those goals like now. As a city, we seem to be enamored with studying things. I get it, I'm a social scientist, but if the committee members themselves, especially in this situation, are attacked for making efforts to ensure the report is accurate, which shouldn't have been controversial, that should give us all pause about the reliability of this document. Body cameras cost so much money, and our community urgently needs some real action on so many of these issues. Our budgets, reflect our values. Let's shift our leadership style to implementing solutions right away and just evaluate them and change them if we need to. I know we can do better and people cannot wait for the help. Body cameras aren't it. Time. Thank you, Amy. Um, our next speaker um, is going to be Keith Finley of Oak Creek Trail. And you should be set. Keith, you're unmuted on our end. Sorry about that. Is that better? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I'm the former co-chair of the BWC Feasibility Review Committee whose report is under consideration. Um, after seven months of intensive study in which we invited 32 and ultimately heard from 18 separate community groups and individuals, many if not most representing marginalized communities. And after intensively studying the social science research on BWCs and taking that research seriously. And I, I have to say, I, I categorically reject the very biased and skewed misleading interpretation you've heard of the way we approach this. Uh, but I'm not going to waste your time with those disputes because I'd rather get to the merits here uh, and tell you that after intensively debating the issues over the course of 27 long meetings, our committee ultimately voted five to one to recommend a body worn camera pilot project, but only if it were undertaken pursuant to a strict set of preconditions and policies that really are unparalleled anywhere in this country in their rigor. Now, here's why I support BWCs. First, as one who has devoted his entire career to representing individual, indigent individuals caught up in our criminal justice system, both as a public defender and then as co-founder and co-director of the Wisconsin Innocence Project, I've seen how the system operates when it has no video evidence and it's often not pretty. As Judge Everett Mitchell, a black man, civil rights leader, pastor and circuit court judge told our committee, we need body worn cameras because police don't need cameras to get convictions, but the accused do need them to defend themselves. When there's a swearing contest in court between a cop and a suspect, the cop wins every time. Second, any impression that may exist out there that our communities of color overwhelmingly oppose BWCs is simply not true. Tell that to all of the black individuals and organizations and members of our committee who addressed us, who get, who told us how important cameras are to their sense of trust and accountability. Or tell that to the family of Andrew Brown Jr., a black man who was shot and killed by police in North Carolina in late April. Police wore body cams, but unlike our proposal, the rules in North Carolina didn't require a prompt release of the footage. Mr. Brown's family pleaded for access to the footage so they could know what really happened. A photograph published in the New York Times said it all. It depicted a family member marching holding a sign that read, would you demand footage if it was your son? You have a chance to heed that plea now. Finally, it's essential to understand that BWCs are a tool, nothing more and nothing less, whether they usher in effective transparency and accountability or more oppression depends on how they're used. Our model policy is designed to ensure that they're used for oversight and transparency of police and not for surveillance of marginalized communities. Um, Let's not forget how important footage can be when used in a context in which we're committed to accountability and transparency. Take the George Floyd I'm, case. May I just have one moment to, to, to finish up? Do we have any objections? I move that they to extend one minute. Thank you. Um, Second, hold on. Oh. Does anybody I want second. to? I okay. second it. Okay, we've got one more minute. 
All right. Um, so I was saying, take the George Floyd case. On that, let me quote from a New York Times editorial by Farhad Manju, a columnist who's quite critical of police. He wrote about the power of having multiple videos of the killing, including BWC footage, in leading to the conviction of Derek Chauvin. He concluded, Chauvin's attorney asked jurors to consider the scene from the officer's point of view. But Chauvin's point of view was caught on tape too, as were the perspectives of his fellow officers. These recordings were rarely exculpatory, and at times, the most chilling details about Chauvin's conduct were caught by his own camera. The bottom line is BWCs are a tool. Unlike so many communities, we are approaching the implementation of BWCs with full attentiveness to regulating their use and creating accountability structures. Our new civilian oversight board and independent police monitor in particular offer a new era of police accountability. It would be unfortunate if just as we create these important accountability mechanisms, we limit their ability to do their work by depriving them of one of the most powerful okay. tools available to them. That's time. Thank you so much. Um, we let's see. We're refreshing. Um, we have next Dr. Mara Aish. Thank you. We have heard a great deal over the last couple of years about body worn cameras. Often we've heard the same things over and over from competing sides. This is an emotional issue for some expressed through rage and anxieties. It's an economic issue for others, for some a money grab. It should be a data-driven decision. Why are we avoiding gathering this data? The research is not conclusive for Madison. We need our own data. Why are we avoiding getting our own data? I am asking you to support the pilot study so that we can make a fair and equitable decision based on data and to establish our own policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will be, let me check this again, um, but we will be returning to um, Tyson Vitali. And you should be. Oh, hello. Can you, you hear it? me now? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry if you can't hear me. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Tyson Vitale, a lifelong resident of Madison, and I've been paying close attention to the um, uh, the report and the, the body cam uh, feasibility committee, uh, as well as going through the process now that we're going through, um, through the committees and council, uh, which we'll be going to shortly. Um, I want to thank all the committee members who have both spoken and have participated in that um, report and that committee. I know they put a lot of work into um, researching and, and looking into this issue, and I really do appreciate that. Um, however, you know, from the work that they've done, what I've seen to the conclusion of, and a lot of clubs have, is that it's not feasible to really actually have accountable, you know, process and system for body cameras like uh, one of the former folks were talking about due to the costs and prohibitive costs. So even when talking about uh, regulating and accountability structures um, and putting those in place and well thought out ones. When you look at those, when you look at doing that and then you look at the costs of what that would actually cost, first off in staff time alone, if we have one sixteenth of allocation of staff time for police officers to you know, go through body cam footage and also the training, um, <clears throat> let's say a half hour each shift, if that's about 116 each cost, it's incredibly prohibitive um, and something we just honestly cannot afford. And we should not be putting money into because a lot of the things that are advocated for on cams to resolve are not actually resolving that issue. For example, if you look at the data, uh, there is, contrary to what some people have said um, and verified with the authors and independent folks, uh, that, you know, we, they will not reduce prosecutions if, if folks view, there's not a process that we can put in place to reduce the prosecutions of marginalized folks um, when body claims are implemented. So what do I mean is there is an increase in prosecution rates uh, that is shown in both um, 
blind studies and non-blind studies uh, for minor crimes and misdemeanors and a lot of other unintended consequences that come up specifically for the community and that we have to address in a different way because this is not the solution. Um, I know it's really easy to want to say, yes, more data, more data, more information so we can work with it. We know we can know what's going on. We can actually maybe address these issues. It would be a good thing. But what, what we do know is that, you know, implementing technology and implementing more data, more information does not necessarily mean more equity. It does not necessarily mean it's going to resolve or solve the issues that we need to address um, at their core. So I am against and please vote against, uh, just like the PSRC and the EOC voted down uh, the implementations of the um, <clears throat> of body cams or the body cam pilot program. Uh, okay. Also, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> You're still here. Oh, did you say time? Could I get one more minute or? Do we have any objections? One more minute. All right, you can have one more. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I'm pulling up my notes. Um, so, uh, also the allocated pilot, like money for the pilot program that we've allocated, won't be sufficient money to even follow the recommendations in the reports. For example, a rigorous randomized controlled trial uh, that was recommended in the report, and the cost will almost definitely be much higher. Um, if some of you were able to listen in on the show, I believe. It's Venues. Uh, for example, the uh, Dean Dems. He has expertise in body cams and was talking very frankly about how almost always across the country, when we implement a body cam program or body cameras in police departments, they end up being much higher in cost than anticipated. Number one, because of IT costs, data storage costs, a lot of hidden and unanticipated fees, but also most importantly, staff time. And when we have a you know budget crunch right now that we need to go through and things that we need to address as a city, and limited resources, I do not believe that we should be spending money on something that is not going to be the most effective in actually addressing the issues that they're saying they're addressing. Um, so please, I'm please, please vote against this. Thank you. Thank you. And let us see, um, Hisela Wilson. Okay, can you hear me this time? We can hear you. Can you hear okay, us? I switched to my computer. Okay. All right. okay. So um, I was present for and testified at several of the body-worn camera feasibility committee meetings. And um, I agree with Greg and Tyson uh, that I really, I understand all the time that went into preparation of the report, but I think it's too biased in favor of body-worn cameras. It looks at the whole a uh, spectrum of research instead of the newer research and the newer data that's coming in from departments that implemented body-worn cameras. Now, there's several drawbacks. Um, one is the use of body camera footage isn't very much good as long as officers have qualified immunity. As has also been said, they're extremely expensive. I'm sure that the report underestimates the cost of body-worn cameras. In a lot of cities, cities are now starting to shut them down because they have found they cost from 8 to 10% of the existing police budget. So you're looking at a time when we're all crying for defund and potentially can't, with all these bills coming through the state, suggesting um, that anybody who tries to reduce funding for the police department um, not receive federal dollars, we're looking to increase the, the police budget by up to 10%. So we really don't want to do that. Um, but the real problem with body worn cameras, other than that a lot of cities are starting to shut them down, is that they don't show what officers are doing to elicit the behavior that gets filmed. What gets filmed typically is not the officer, but rather um, the accused. And what this is going to do, I mean, maybe there are multiple officers, but um, and, and that might help. But it takes a lot of time to review the film, a lot of officer hours, and the officers can turn them off or worse, set the stage to incriminate an accused. Um, what has happened when you look at the data, 
that police using body cameras actually end up having evidence that um, they that evolves just simply at the point of um, them actually trying to uh, go after uh, someone to arrest them or just in a casual exchange. So this is usually typically low level crime and it's not the kind of crime that we really need to address. I think the use of body worn cameras is actually not going to increase police accountability at all. Um, you, this pilot, you know, there's no way to enforce the pre um, Just like restrictions on this time. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to give this one more refresh to make sure we haven't missed anybody. Okay, um, we are now com have completed the uh, testimony from the public. Um, does anybody have questions for our registrants? Alder Harrington McKinney. Um, this uh, committee still available for questions? Who, who are you asking for? Uh, um, Finley, excuse me. Mr. Finley, is he still available? He's still on the meeting, yes. Okay, if he's not, then I would, uh, my question no, I to him. Oh, he is there, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, um, Mr. Finley, um, one of the things that uh, keeps coming up is um, uh, the, the validity of the work that the committee uh, did in terms of producing the report. Could you briefly summarize that you, um, what did you look at and how uh, the final, you said they were um, five, four, and one against the, um, the recommendation. Could you summarize that again? Because I think that we've lost the concept of hearing what the committee actually did in that work over the seven months. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, we worked really hard up to meeting multiple times a week in the final weeks going over the, uh, the research in depth, in detail. We summarized it all. We listed the pros, we listed the cons. We went bent over backwards to try to present both sides to be fair and objective. The way this has been portrayed that somehow we forced Greg Golembic out by not letting him speak is frankly patently absurd. We bent over backwards to let him have opportunities to speak. When he said that he needed more time to make edits, we requested a one month extension of time from the common council precisely so that we could hear all of his objections and complaints. Uh, and he told us that would be enough time. Then when that time was up, we said, look, we have to set a deadline so that we can get our work done. We have to set a deadline uh, for final edits. And at that point, he just quit. He just resigned and said, and it wasn't because we didn't let him speak. It's because he, there was no end to it and there was nothing. I, I, I got the distinct impression he was just trying to run out the clock. And in the end, we voted five to one in favor of the pilot project. The one person who voted against us, against the project, that is who voted in alignment with Greg Golembic, joined in a letter completely rebuking and rebuffing all of his complaints about the unfairness of the process. If you really, I wrote a long letter to the common council explaining precisely what we did, when we did it, 
please take a look at that. Don't take his view for it. It's very biased, skewed, and grossly inaccurate and unfair. This isn't about Greg Golembek, no matter how much he wants it to be about us disliking him because he's a science. This isn't about him. It's about the social science research that we took very, very seriously to the point that I, uh, I, I reached out to the author of one of the studies to make to center our language to make sure we were summarizing it correctly. Um, she said we were. I have since then had communication with a number of the leading scholars in this field, um, including people Greg Golembic relies upon, relied upon repeatedly, including Seth Stoughton um, and Cynthia Lum um, and, uh, and and Anthony Braga, people who wrote this, the important studies in this field. They are all incredibly impressed by our report thrilled and excited by the possibility of doing a study of, of, uh, of doing a pilot project here because they see us as doing something that's so unique. That is trying to implement body worn cameras pursuant to the kinds of constraints we wrote into our report that has never been tested anywhere to know actually how it works. That's why we want the pilot project to say, look, we don't, all of these, so many of the complaints we're hearing about what how body worn cameras are implemented are based on systems in other jurisdictions that don't follow the regulations we set forth in our model policy. It's as if people complaining about what we're proposing haven't even read the report or the policy. I, I'm just to, totally baffled by it. Um, so anyway, the process was rigorous, thorough. Uh, there is also um, uh, a number of these na national researchers are very interested in joining us with us in doing the pilot project. They have some ideas about how to restructure the pilot project to make it empirically valid, uh, which I would love to talk with some of the alders about. Um, we have a chance to do this right to make things work uh, and to, to be a national model in that regard. If we don't do it and we don't do it that way, we are going to continue to be outliers in a world where body worn cameras are being adopted everywhere else, where suspicion arises because we don't have them. What are we hiding? Um, and, and in a world where Cost is 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 uh, is, is such a, a frightening specter for folks. Yeah, they'll cost some money, but keep in mind the legislature is about to pa uh, pass a bill providing grants for for funding for body worn camera systems. We better get something up and running so we can get in on that, minimize the costs. The costs are not nearly as extensive as people uh, as as people proclaim here, and more than anything. We have civilian oversight. We have two things are required to make this work. The tools to gather evidence for accountability and the institutional structures to ensure that accountability and transparency occur. We are developing those institutional structures. Let's give them the tools now. Did, I hope that answered the question. If you have other Thank specific you. questions about our process <laughs> or the vote, please let me know. Thank you. All right, next we have um, Alder Benford. Thank you, Vice President Martin. Um, I certainly am not going to ask this question to feel of uh, interpersonal conflict. That's quite evident tonight. But I guess it highlights that there's divergent opinions around this uh, subject. But I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Galimblick, please. Yes, you should be unmuted. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Greg, and everybody who spoke tonight. Uh, Greg, I have a question for you. And uh, once again, it's not my intent to fuel the fire of what looks like, once again, uh, a personal matter between a couple people. But I wanted to ask you a question. So I asked this question recognizing that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Things are getting better. But when I think about cost, any cost, uh, I, I know that you raised some questions about the true cost. Can you help clarify that a little bit? Uh, there's one thing stated in the report, but uh, in your research, uh, what would the cost be? A guess, a guesstimate. Nobody knows, and that's what's kind of problematic with this too. But can you tell me? Sure. The um, 
My best guesstimate for the cost over five years would be $23 million. Um, I've provided you that information letter and the supports for that cost. Um, one of the problems is that in the report, the cost is greatly understated. Um, and that was because that the report, the draft report, including the financial aspect for it, um, which I never really got a chance to provide input on, was written by Keith Finley. And as you can tell, Keith Finley is a very strong proponent of body cameras. The largest component of that 23 million is personnel cost. Um, we're talking about an estimate of half an hour per shift for officers to do body camera layout tasks like reviewing the video, the video uploading the video, um, the, um, the deletions that have to be made in the video before it's released. So that, that's really the largest cost. Another cost that's really not adequately um, considered is training costs. So, you know, when body cams are first introduced, departments take um, an officer will have one to three days of training that's required. And under the model policy, um, there is recurrent training that is supposed to occur every year. Um, there's also cost of data storage um, that's substantial. The cameras themselves are not that expensive. Um, but the personal cost is by far the largest cost. And, you know, in this time of, of budget shortfalls, and when you think about where this money could be allocated, that really should be a consideration. Because if you want to maximize public safety, um, I could think of other ways to allocate this money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, or Madam Chair, Vice President Martin. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Alder Bennett, I did see that you had your hand up. Um, did you? Brian, same brains, different mind. Okay. All right. Do we have any more questions for our registrants? Okay. So um, next, um, oh, uh, questions for registrants? Nope. Questions for staff? All right. We're going to questions for staff. So uh, Alder Carter. Go ahead. Yeah. What staff is here today? Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we have um, Attorney Haas, uh, Captain Brian Austin, Chief Barnes. Um, and I think that is it for the kind of police side. Okay, um, my question, and I don't know who wants to answer it, um, but my question is this, com you know, a couple of things. We've been talking about body cameras for a long, long time. Um, and the, the cost of body cameras have changed over this long period of time that we as a council, not us specifically, but the council in general has been talking about body cameras. Uh, um, Attorney Haas, um, were you, did you attend this um, review committee? Uh, yes, Captain Austin and I, uh, I think between us attended all of the meetings. Okay, and when you uh, and Captain Austin, if you want to chime in, I didn't see you, but I see you clearly now. Um, if can you tell me that um, how the outreach to the different um, organizations and and um, communities were uh, held and what information you heard from, the, especially the communities where a large proportion of them are have interaction with the police um, and have been um, um, spent some time in the county jail and state prison. How did that outreach go? 
Um, Alder Carter, I, I'm happy to give my observations, but I think in my mm -hmm. answer to that question, it, um, Attorney Haas and I were were staff members. We didn't set up the outreach efforts or talk to the the individuals and organizations that were were contacted. Um, so I think that the, the uh, committee chair would probably be in a better position to. But in observation, how did you think that interaction went? I guess that's what I want to know. Um, I, I think uh, from my standpoint, it seemed to be a, a very diverse group that was contacted. Um, I, I know that there were many, several organizations um, from the reports of the committee members of groups that were contacted that didn't respond to that contact. So they were invited to attend and present and did not. Um, I, you know, the dialogue um, back and forth between the, the people that did present to the committee and, and the committee members was robust and and candid and respectful. And so I, I think from my observations, the, the process by which that feedback was gathered um, was very, um, very methodical, um, very fair, and, and seemed to be, uh, again, very, very robust. Thank you. And, um... Attorney Haas, my, my next question to you is obviously uh, people on this committee had different opinions about um, being on this committee and, 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 the, and the report. Um, can you tell me if in your observation was everyone on the committee treated fair and the ability to voice their opinion. And uh, there were a lot of it. So I just want you to know, I know there were a lot of opinions. So uh, just my personal opinion from what I observed, yeah. there there was plenty of time. The The meetings, I mean, they, they were definite any times, but in some cases the committee continued on past that time. I mean, my personal opinion was that everybody had ample opportunity to ask questions and participate in, in the discussion. Um, and at the same time, I think the meetings were, you know, they, they tried to focus on eventually getting to some conclusions so that there would be a written product for, for, the, uh, for the council to consider. Okay, thank you. At the appropriate time, Vice President Martin, I would like to move acceptance of the report. All right, thank you. Um, next, we have Alder Lemmer. Thank you. I have a question for Attorney Haas. So my understanding of what's in front of us is we are not taking any action at all on body-worn cameras today. And accepting the, the report is basically um, confirming receipt of the report. It doesn't even indicate agreement or opposition with any of the contents of the report. It's merely acknowledging acceptance of the report. Is that correct? And you can, can you speak to what accepting the report means basically? Sure. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, because of the, the recent change in the ordinance, uh, just to clarify, accepting the report, that's, uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, Alder, at the same time, the CCEC can make a recommendation to the council if it wishes to on the substance of the report. Um, you know, there was a previous committee that that did that. So CCEC can, CCEC can decide if it wants to make a recommendation to merely accept the report, which would indicate basically that the report has been completed and submitted to the council. The ordinance specifies that any additional action needs to be specified in a motion, either the same motion or a separate motion. Um, if, if CCC wants to um, make any recommendation about the pilot or uh, using body cams in general, 
then that should be specified uh, in the motion, but merely accepting the report does not indicate agreement with the report or its recommendations. Okay, thank you. That's all I have for right now. Um, I have no more hands up. Does anybody else have any questions for staff before we move on? All right, seeing no more, I think it is time for a motion. I move to accept the report, the final report of the um, body worn camera feasibility review committee. Um, we have a motion uh, to accept by Alder Carter. Um, Alder Harrington McKinney. I second. And we have a second. So now we are um, ready for discussion. Alder, oh. Alder Bennett, did you mean to put your hand back down? Yeah. Alder Carter, speak to. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Alder Carter, go ahead. Yes. Um, when I came into the, as a member of the council back in 2015, we were talking about body worn cameras. And even before then, we were talking about body worn cameras. At some point, we have to have our own data. And you might think that, no, we don't need data, we can take it from here. But let me just give you this example. You're in the hospital. The maintenance man comes and says, I've been assigned to do open heart surgery. I've been told through data that Illinois, New Jersey, and Florida, that this is an easy operation you will survive very splendidly. And how many of you are gonna go into that operating room with the maintenance man? Not that the maintenance man can't do it, but how many of you are gonna have confidence in that? We can no longer depend on bystanders turning on their cell phones and putting it on social media so we know what happened. We can no longer depend on outside forces to tell us what happened. What is the price? Give it to me, because I want to know what the price is that is acceptable not to know what happened to your loved one. What would Emmett Till's mother pay to know what happened to her 14 year old son in Mississippi that was abducted in the middle of the night and lynched? What price would she have to pay? Are body cameras the end all? No. Not at all. We need several things going on. But at some point, at some point, we have to do the right thing. At some point that we can no longer straddle the fence. We know there's for, we know there's against. We are all very outspoken. But at some point, we have to have our own data. Tonight, we are just accepting the report. That's what we're doing tonight. But in the future, we're gonna be doing more than that. And I would hope that this membership class will be the ones that get off the fence and do something. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Carter. Um, before we go to Alder Bennett, who is next, I do want to remind everybody here that it is now 5.54 and we absolutely 100% must end by 6.15. So um, while making comments, please keep that in mind. We've got just oh, 19 minutes left. So with that, um, Alder Bennett, you're on. Sweet. 
tweet. Thanks. All right, let's be brief. So I don't support the motion that we have in front of us today. Um, instead, I think from what Attorney Haas said that we, this body can accept the, re accept the report, which is different than adopting it, which is not what we're voting on today. But I think there's an opportunity for us to make a recommendation similar to what um, Public Safety Review Committee and the Equal Opportunities Commission made to recognize um, that there are discrepancies within the report and the, that this body um, does recommends to not pursue the pilot program or full deployment of body worn cameras. I think that to I think that to dispute um, the very, um, let me try to say, moral arguments made by Alder Carter right now, um, it's a difficult task to tackle. And I wonder, we are we going to sit here today and tackle those moral issues where I can make the same arguments right now with how Breonna Taylor, her entire murder was recorded and she still has not just, she still has not received justice. And I can look, point to how my own family members look like Breonna Taylor or they could have torn into her home and she would have not received justice even though they had body cameras. <laughs> There are discrepancies within the data throughout the entire report that it outlines. It outlines um, specifically the issues that we are trying to tackle with about um, reducing police violence. And the report states that there's overall no significant reduction in police use of force. And I think that it's a false dilemma to look to um, an issue within a hospital and try to compare that with the issue that we're facing right now. The report also states, quote, to expect body worn cameras to significantly reduce police violence is too much and to miss other sources of potential value or a potential downside of body worn cameras. In other words, we're putting too much pressure on these body worn cameras in which cost, at least, well, by the report cost at least a million, um, $11 million. And not to mention the hundreds of millions of dollars, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that it will take to upkeep this program. So I don't think that this, I don't think that body worn cameras are the move that we need to be making for Madison right now. Um, I do think that this body can make, um, can act upon that and make a, um, accept the report with the recommendation that um, the, Common Council Executive Committee, or well, okay, I'm making my motion now. So I'm, I'm motioning that we recommend um, that um, the Common Council Executive Committee um, recognizes the, the discrepancies within the report and therefore does not recommend implementation of the pilot program or um, the full implementation of body worn cameras. Um, Attorney Haas, is that motion a uh, in order? I think there are two options. One are to make it an amendment to the motion to accept. The other option would be to act on the, and if Alder Bennett wants to make that amendment, then if there's a second that would be acted on, the other option would be to act on the motion to accept the report. As I said, that doesn't indicate any agreement with the report. Get that out of the way and then consider 
there could be an, a second motion made um, if Alder Bennett wishes to regarding the other, uh, you know, the, the other input or recommendations. Um, I guess for time concerns, I will do um, an amendment to the, the motion with the stated language. Do we have a second for um, the amendment? Um, Alder Heck is seconding. Um, next is Alder Harrington committee. Oh, wait, no, we discussed this motion, correct? The amendment, um, Alder Harrington. I have a point of order. Yes. Okay, my point of order is, is that I'm not clear on the dispensation of uh, um, Alder Carter's motion. So I'm confused and so I'm not able to vote because uh, I'm, I'm not clear about uh, the motion that was uh, made and, and seconded and the dispensation of that one and now the amendment and how they overlay. And so I would definitely need clarification from the, um, uh, from the attorney, just so what's so. So what's before the committee now is the amendment. Alder Bennett initially made it as a motion, but it's an amendment. So this vote is strictly on the additional language that the that she proposed. It is not on the motion to accept. It is whether or not you want to include the language uh, recommending no pilot program or no implementation of body cam committee or uh, body cams, and I think essentially forwarding what PSRC uh, stated in its recommendation. So that's the motion before you now, after that is acted on, then you will get to the motion uh, to accept. Does that answer your question, Alder Harrington McKinney? And so a vote uh, um, yes is for the amendment and a vote no is against the amendment. Uh, correct, correct. Okay, I'm clear. All right, thank you. Um, Alder Rahelier. Oops. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused too. So I think the point of order might be to vote on what was ahead of us first and have a roll call. And then if that fails, then we can go on the second for uh, Alder Bennett uh, amendment. No, the, the, it's an amendment. You act on the amendment first, and then you dispose of that, whether or not you want to include that in the motion, and then you act on the motion to accept. She made an amendment to the motion. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, the amendment to the motion is that basically the committee recommends not implementing the pilot program or full implementation. And then I guess after that, we can on the... Yeah, so we will be voting on the additional language. The amendment is the additional language presented by Alder Bennett. Do we have any discussion on this, on the amendment? Uh, Alder Carter. No, I don't have any discussion on it. Oh, okay, sorry. Was my hand up? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got kicked out and then I had to come back in. Sorry. No problem. Um, Alder Heck. Thank you, uh, Vice President. I, uh, I'm going to be supporting this amendment and it's exactly what I supported at Public Safety Review Committee. And I'd remind folks that this, even this recommendation, if, if this amendment is adopted, uh, does not uh, uh, or, or, or keep us from adopting body cam pilot program or a full blown program that will be decided by Common Council. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Heck. Do we have any more? Oh, Alder uh, Harrington uh, McKinney. I went to call for the for the question, and with the roll call. Okay. Um, do we have any objections? I see no objections, so we will be voting now on the amendment um, and be taking a roll call vote. President Abbas is excused. Um, Vice President, oh no, and then Vice President Martin, you are as chair not voting. Okay, Alder Lemmer. 
No. Alder Lemmer, no. Alder Bennett? Aye. Alder Bennett, aye. Alder Wahalia? No. Alder Wahalia, no. Alder Heck? Aye. Alder Heck, aye. Alder Harrington McKinney? No. Alder Harrington McKinney, no. And because President Abbas is excused, I believe Alder Carter, you are voting member this meeting. So Alder Carter? No. Alder Carter, no. We have two ayes and four no's. All right, um, that the amendment fails and now we have returned to the original um, motion to accept the report from Alder Carter. Do we have any further discussion on the original motion? All right, seeing no hands raised, um, let us vote on the original motion. Um, and I will have uh, Karen uh, call the roll. Um, President Voss is excused. Vice President Martin is not voting. Alder Lemmer? Aye. Alder Lemmer, aye. Alder Bennett? Aye. Alder Bennett, aye. Alder Wahalia? Aye. Alder Wahalia, aye. Alder Heck? Aye. Alder Heck, aye. Alder Harrington McKinney? Aye. Alder Harrington McKinney, aye. Alder Carter? Oh, Alder you're Carter? Muted. Aye. Alder Carter, aye. One, two, three, four, five, six. With six ayes. Motion oh, All right, unanimous. Guess if we didn't need that roll call. Um, so seeing as how it is now 6.07, um, I would entertain a motion to um, refer our remaining item, item four, um, to a future meeting. Alder Wahelier? Yeah, I was going to make that motion. Okay, that is moved. We have a second. 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 Alder Lemmer, I saw your hand first. Um, I, without, if I see no objections, um, I will assume a, a unanimous uh, support or a unanimous eyes. Does anybody have any objections? Um, Alder Wilhelia, is your, is your hand up because you have a, oh, nope, okay. All right, so no objections and we will be referring the remainder of our schedule, our calendar to um, a, a future meeting. Um, and now we, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. A move. So, I can. Can. Moved and I saw, who did I see? Alder Hex, I think I saw your hand go up. Um, and without any objections, we are adjourned. Thank you. We'll see you in a few minutes.